So I would argue, I would argue okay. that the assassination of Khania was intended to provoke Iran into attacking Israel directly so as to give Israel a perfect excuse to go and bomb Iran's nuclear program. David Wu, how are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. I'm a big fan and uh, been a big fan for a while and uh, just really great to great to be here with you. So, But I really wanted to start it out with everything seems to be about to hit the fan in your neck of the woods. I'd love to chat about that, um, how you see things and uh, playing out over there or even what's happening right now. Yeah. So as you know, I'm in Israel and I think, you know, I think, you know, I think, you know, for your audience, I think it's very important to understand the bigger picture. What is the bigger picture? The bigger picture is the fact that, you know, as Anthony Blinken even admitted in so many words two weeks ago, Iran is basically two weeks away from putting its hands on nuclear weapons. Again, Iran has enriched so much, basically, uranium. At this point, if they decide to go build a nuclear weapon, they're literally like two weeks away. In fact, actually, they're a month away from building five nuclear bombs. So that's what we're talking about right here. Now, the question really is, you know, when are they going to basically pull the trigger and go for it? Now, I would argue that, you know, in many ways that, you know, with Trump right now still in the lead in the U.S. presidential race, Iran has a huge incentive to basically make a run for nuclear immunity before the U.S. election. Because there is nobody, I would argue that Iran doesn't fear any country, any person, except for one person. His name is Donald J. Trump. Trump was the guy who ordered the assassination of Soleimani. Trump was the guy who imposed the biggest sanctions on Iran ever, right? So as far as Iran is concerned, Trump is not just unpredictable. Trump is crazy. So from that point of view, I would argue that, you know, given Trump is still in the lead and given that Iran is so close to the finish line, they might decide to go for it, you know, basically yeah. before the U.S. election. Now, of course, the only country that can stop Iran in the track is, of course, Israel. Right. Because it's very clear that, you know, the Biden administration has done everything to basically appease, you, you know, Iran. Right? right. From Iran's standpoint, they're not afraid of the U.S., right? They're not afraid of the U.S. because, like, Biden has gone out of his way to make life very easy for Iran, including basically, you know, literally stop implementing the existing U.S. sanctions on Iranian oil exports. I mean, this is the reason why Iranian oil export has gone up 10 times in the last two years from about $150,000 barrels per day to now 1.5 million barrels per day. So Iran is convinced that it has nothing to be worried about as far as Biden is concerned, okay? Especially given the way that Biden ran out of Afghanistan. It just doesn't think the Democratic Party has the appetite to do anything to stop Iran from basically getting to the nuclear finish line. The only country that can and will is Israel. And that's where, you know, this is, that's what this current situation is about. You need to understand. Now, and I've been saying this for a while. I mean, you know, those of you guys are interested, you can check out my YouTube channel because everything I do is, I'm in the prediction business. And at the end of the day, I just want to be right. And I think I've got a whole reputation to basically, uh, to defend. But the point here is that, you know, I've been saying for a few weeks that actually geopolitical risk was set to moderate before Bibi Netanyahu basically goes to Washington and address U.S. Congress. And I said at the same time that after he returns, basic geopolitical risk was going to surge. In my view, it's unlikely to be a coincidence that Bibi comes back from, you know, Washington, D.C., and three days later, you know, the head of, the head of basically a Hamas uh, political leader was dead. OK, I personally think and again, I have no idea if this is true or not. My feeling is that my guess, my gut feeling tells me that this assassination, if it's carried out by Israel, likely had basically, you know, a blessing from the Biden administration. 
People might say, oh, but why? Like, until now, Biden has been softy, softy when it comes to Iran. Why all of a sudden, why all of a sudden does change? Well, I think it's very simple if you think about this. Biden had just been forced out of the presidential race. Forced out of is the right word. Because the guy is very bitter. In fact, his wife is very bitter. Like, they had, you know, the Democrats were rallying around him one second, and next second, you know, he was thrown off the bus, basically. Now, think about this. So if Biden, before he was forced out of the race, all he cared about was keeping oil price low, as low as possible, at least until the election, so that the economy wouldn't, be, wouldn't experience a sudden shock, I would argue right now, perhaps the same incentive to keeping oil price low is not quite the same. In fact, you could argue that Biden is so bitter of having been forced out that at this point, maybe he doesn't even care if Kamala Harris were to go on to beat Trump or not. You could even make the case if Kamala Harris were to lose, there would be many people within the Democratic Party who are going to say, wow, what did we do? We should have kept, basically, we should have stayed with Biden. Okay. So from that point of view, I think it's very important to understand because at the end of the day, my whole framework is based on a lot of what I do is about applying game theory to making predictions. And making yeah. and using game theory to make predictions is about understanding the reaction function of the individuals around the table playing this very complex chess games. Now, what is very clear to me is that Biden, Biden's incentive, okay, to appease Iran has something changed. And I think actually, if anything, if Biden becomes convinced together with Blinken and Sullivan and others that Iran is about to make a run for nuclear immunity, they might decide they have no choice but to stop Iran, even if it means allowing Israel to do it, okay, the dirty work, which, which, which is what I think Israel offered to do. If you actually listen to what Bibi said in his U.S. Congress address, I think that's pretty much what he said, which is that we're going to do what has to be done. Just give us the arms. Yeah. Okay. So my view is that this is why, for what it was worth, again, I can't prove it, but again, it's consistent with the, you know, the evolving, you know, incentives as we, with respect to the, you know, reaction function of Iran ahead of the U.S. election, Biden you know, having quitted the race in Israel cannot afford to allow Iran to go for it. So as a result, we're right here. So I would argue, I would argue okay, that the assassination of Hania was intended to provoke Iran into attacking Israel directly so as to give Israel a perfect excuse to go and bomb Iran's nuclear program. That's okay. my view. Okay. So and, and if that happens, of course, Goes without saying. I mean, obviously, you know, a lot of your audience trades commodities, resources. I mean, obviously, oil price will go a lot higher. I mean, gold price will go a lot higher. But there is one thing to bear in mind, and this is where the uncertainty is, in my view. Okay, which is, you know, it's possible that Iran, Iran, we have to understand the Iranians are very smart. It's just like everybody. Everybody's very smart except for Biden. Obviously, he's an idiot. Right. But the Iranians are smart, the Iranians are smart, and so on and so forth. And they, Iran understands. I think Iran is reading the situation pretty much probably like I am. They're probably following my YouTube channel, which is concluding that maybe this is a trap. And they may not decide to do this. Okay. I mean, this is consistent with what they said yesterday, which is that we want to punish Israel, but we don't want to escalate the regional tension. So that's the situation right now. So I would give it about, let's say, a 20% chance that there will be, Israel will have no choice but to attack Iran's nuclear program before the election, whether it's in the summer, whatever it is, who knows, Iran is going to basically preserve the element of surprise. But I think if you look at the incentive functions of everybody around the table, that's the story. Yeah. Okay. So you said a lot there. Um, and I guess that you said about a 20% chance. That is really interesting. And it makes a lot of sense too. And just spite of what was said, I want to say yesterday. And just this huge escalation, it seems like all of a sudden there is some kind of de-escalation. And I was really like, in light of talking to you, I was like yesterday morning, I was thinking this might just be a coin flip. But then again, 
here we are talking. Um, so when you say it's a trap, what do you mean it's a trap? A trap like who? Again, this is my point. That Israel assassinated, carry out the assassination against Hania, okay, uh -huh. in order to provoke Iran to attacking Israel. Yep. So give Israel an excuse to go basically bomb Iran's nuclear program. That's my hypothesis. Yeah, uh, this, that this makes a lot of sense. It's a hypothesis, but I think it makes sense given the current polit geopolitical setup. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. And then my point here is that. Baby would have likely had the U.S. blessing to do yeah. something. Like this. And then if I'm right about this and Iran starts to wise up to this, they might decide, wow, do we really want to do this? Do we yeah. really want to strike Israel to give them an excuse? So I think this is, becomes a bit of a, you know, you know, this is going to be a, um, yeah, kind of mouse game. Let's put it that way. Okay. So, uh, golly. I mean, what do we do with all that? So what's really the next shoe to drop then is it, I mean, it's not like there's going to be peace today or tomorrow. <laughs> um, well, the market doesn't care. I mean, the market doesn't care if there's peace. Well, I mean, with the Ukraine war has gone on for two and a half years. The right. market doesn't care one way or the other, you know, except for a very brief time. So I think from that point of view, geopolitical risk is not one of these things that you can trade, you know, especially if you're a late person at home trying to do this and do that. I think geopolitical risk is something that the market cares only when it's literally like blowing up in your face. And, and then the market has a tendency to overreact. But what I'm telling you right now is that we're quite right now talking about a 20% probability. Yeah. And I think, you know, we have to wait and see, you know, because every day I'm going to change my mind about that probability going up, going down, that kind of thing. And then, yeah. You know, trying to read the tea leaves is what I do. And, and, and then, you know, in this respect, and I think from that point of view, like as of today, I would, I would argue probably until a couple of days ago, I was thinking maybe there was a 35% chance. Well, one third chance. I think right now it's coming down to 20. Okay. Got because it. it seems that Iran seems to be getting the joke. You got it. Okay. So let's talk about uh, election here. You had Trump with all of this momentum. Um, right after he the assassination attempt and right really right before that he was he had all of this momentum coming on now it seems like kamala has all of this or has switched it and she has the momentum how do you see the u.s elections playing out here and again that's a complete wild card as well but how do you really read that and look at that and what effect does that have on the markets obviously it seems like uh, a trump presidency would be very pro-market but I mean, yeah, just give me your thoughts on all that. I think, first of all, we, we've got to take a step back for a moment. I, I think, you know, like I've been telling my clients, I mean, I, I, mean, I have an institutional investment advisory business, with, and I count some of the biggest hedge funds, sovereign wealth funds, you know, pension funds, <laughs> mutual funds as my clients. And so this is, these are smart money. And I've been telling them for the last, I would say, 10 days that Kamala is likely to you know, you know, momentum is with Kamala during the honeymoon, right? I mean, the honeymoon is not going to last forever, but definitely she hasn't peaked yet. Definitely momentum is likely to peak only after the convention at the end of the month. So I think from that point, we also have to understand what this is about, right? Because like, you know, the Democratic Party right now is feeling very energized. The mainstream media is giving Kamala completely, you know, the benefit of doubt, okay? So from that point of view, you can see the treatment that they're giving her is quite different than the treatment that they gave Biden, okay? And I think from that point of view, it's interesting because mainstream media has been extremely forgiving about everything that's come out of her mouth. I mean, frankly speaking, she hasn't said anything of any interest. She has been essentially swimming in, Total generality. And I think from that point of view, like, you know, the mainstream media can't get her on anything, but then they're going to say, well, she's new. So we got to give her some time to figure it out. So I think from that point of view, like, you know, she's in the honeymoon, no doubt. The honeymoon has its, you know, has its, um, has its run and it won't last forever. Because I think when we come back in September, okay, after Labor Day, that's when the election really begins in earnest in terms of the final stretch. 
I think that's when, obviously, whether there will be debate or no debate, I'm certain there will be debates, probably even more than one debate. I suspect that, you know, Kamala stars will have, will struggle. The reason is because, let's think about this. Let's put it this way. U.S. elections are not decided on abortion rights. Okay. No doubt about that. If that's her strongest suit, she has a problem, especially given the fact, as you know, Trump is probably the most reasonable Republican candidate when it comes to, uh, you know, <laughs> abortion. Then I don't know since when. I mean, in fact, because of Trump's, you know, because Trump says, Trump, Trump's home, he's, he's anti-abortion only after 15 weeks, right? So he's totally, he has no problem whatsoever with first-term abortion. So his main issue is with the third-term abortion. And then, by the way, like, I think the only other country that has the same sort of, like, you know, that allows third-term abortion for whatever reason is North Korea, okay? Yeah. And, and China, okay? So I think Trump, 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 I think Trump has a very pragmatic stance on abortion. And then because of Trump, if you look at the Republican official policy platform, they're no longer calling for banning abortion. They're all saying the Republican Party agenda basically says it's up to the states. Yep. So I think so from that point of view, we've already seen a huge moderation of the position of the Republican Party when it comes to abortion, which actually, I think, makes her stance very difficult to defend. Now, now let's talk about things that people really do care about. One yeah. is the economy mm -hmm. and the other one is obviously immigration. On the economy, you know. I think, you know, clearly she had, Kamala Harris has never been involved in the economic policy of this administration. And she is not an economist. She could not possibly, she won't be able to carry a conversation for more than, you know, 10 seconds about the economy. So I think from that point of view, I think actually it's very interesting because the stock market correction over the last, you know, week or so, I think it's very bullish for Trump, ironically. Because I think this correction definitely it has raised the concerns about recession. The economy is slowing for sure. And I think the stock market correction will probably only strengthen the downward tendency of the economy at the moment. Okay. And then to the extent that Trump was leading Biden by a huge distance when it comes to how he was doing in polls with respect to his economic, his handle on the economy, I think now that the economy is back on the agenda, back on everybody's radar screen, I actually think this is going to benefit Trump hugely, especially against Kamala more than anybody else. Okay. Right. Second issue goes without saying is immigration. Right there, there's no doubt. Kamala Harris has said a lot of things, okay, that have been, you know, that have been video, that have been written that. So from that point of view, I, I think, you know, let's put it this way. You know, 65% of Americans in recent polls said that they're in favor of mass deportation, including 40% of Democrats. Yeah, that's huge. Now, I'm, not, I'm not saying is that a good thing or bad thing. I don't know. I don't, we can talk about that separately. But the point here is that what she represents in terms of her approach to immigration, illegal immigration, is completely out of sync with yep. at least two thirds of Americans, Democrats and Republicans. Yep. So, and that is a second big issue. So if you look at you know, immigration, you look at the economy, not to mention the Gaza war, right? 80% of Americans say again and again in polls that they are pro-Israel. Only 20% are pro-Hamas and Kamala Harris is pro-Hamas. So again, she's in a very, very small minority. You can run for, you can run in a primary election at the extreme end of your party, but you cannot run in a general election without literally trying to take the middle ground. And I think right now, Kamala Harris is surrounding the middle ground to Trump. And I think that is going to be a problem when voters start to focus on the real issues in this race. Got it. Let's talk about the economy here um, quickly. Well, not quickly, but yeah, let's talk about the economy here. We obviously had this huge, massive sell-off that started uh, mid to late last week, if you would. And now there are rumors of 
a Fed and emer- possibly an emergency. Just, these are just rumors. Emergency meeting with the Fed where they'll be cutting. I think they'll absolutely cut in September if there is no emergency meeting. How close to the, I mean, are we really in trouble here? I, I think you know, it's actually very interesting because I've been bearish and, but, you know, yeah. like, you know, but, but again, I think what the market did over the last, you know, week or so, we have to understand exactly what happened because again, if you want to make predictions, you have to understand what happened first, because I right. think the starting point is crucial when you want to make a decent prediction. First of all, there's no doubt the economy is slowing. Okay. And um, there are a lot of signs of a slowing economy, especially the job market data. Now, the only question is, how fast is the economy slowing? Because the market, for the most part, is only interested in second derivative. Everybody gets the first derivative. So if you want to trade the market, you have to understand the second derivative. Now, I would argue, if you look at, if we look back at the second quarter GDP number that was released, you know, 10 days ago, it was very interesting. You know, other than inventory, okay, rebuild, which, you know, contributed 80, per, 80 basis points to the 2.8% GDP growth, the other two major drivers of the faster than expected GDP growth in the second quarter, one was defense spending, the other one was AI chips, <laughs> spending on AI chips. Okay. Yep. Now, defense spending is consistent with the fact that, again, Jenna Yellen, America's fiscal sorcerer, is doing everything to get her boss reelected, right? I mean, this is why <laughs> pumping money like there's no tomorrow. So yeah, so we saw a bit of a slowdown in government hiring in, in the July numbers, but I think that's probably just a look, okay? Government has been the biggest hirer, okay, in terms of like, you know, the number of people being, I mean, it's just pretty amazing if you think about this because it's such a small, it, 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 you know, as a, as a share of total employment is still small, but as a share of New jobs created in the U.S. last year, it just threw the roof, the U.S. federal government, which is so astonishing because I'm, I've been doing this for a long time. I've never seen an administration, American administration, who has done everything for a political reason. I mean, it is, they have just like, you know, they, they have to basically get a price for this. This is like a record, okay, in terms of manipulating every aspect of the U.S. in order to improve the chance of the sitting president against Donald Trump. But the bottom line here is, so government spending is still, I'm going to assume that for the time being, they're still keeping it going. Mm -hmm. The other part, which is very, very important, is spending on AI chips. Mm -hmm. Now, this is actually very important, right? Because, you know, AI chips, spending on AI chip probably accounted for a good 15%, I think, GDP growth in the first and second. Wow. Okay. So that's a very, very big thing, right? I mean, because, I mean, you heard what Microsoft said last week. They are like buying chips, like Hanover Fizz. Like they say, like whatever they can buy, they're leasing them. Right. Now, the question really is, okay, so, you know, NVIDIA is making a lot of money that we all know. The question is, with all this investment in new chips, are the likes of Microsoft, Amazon, Google, Facebook, are they making money? The answer is no. Okay. The only reason why the spending on these chips hasn't hit their earnings yet is because, as you know, in the U.S., under, you know, American accounting law, you can take your time in terms of expensing CapEx spending costs on, you know, through slowly, gradually through depreciation. Right. So as a result, these, the spending on these very exorbitant chips hasn't really hit home yet for the stock market because it hasn't enter into either price earnings or for that matter, you know, profit margin for these companies. This is the reason why in the first quarter, the Magnum 7, their earnings went up 50% on a year on year comparison. Now, if you, if you factor in what they spent on these chips, it will look like a very, very different picture. I can assure you that. But the point here is that at least for the time being, you know, as much as I want to say that, oh, wow, the stock market, this and that, it doesn't feel to me that these companies, because these companies are sitting on a lot of cash. Yeah. Okay. And secondly, the way they're looking at this, it's actually, it's ridiculous. It's a bit like high school. Okay. Like, you know, you know, if you're not a smoker, you're going to be banished. Okay. From the politically correct crowd, because this is like, you know, Microsoft and I mean, this is what Facebook pretty much said, right? 
you know, we have to we have to invest in AI, okay? Only because others are doing the same. And if we don't and others do, we could put, potentially put ourselves at risk of being left behind. So you've got this, you know, almost frantic, you know, you know, sort of like breathless embrace of this technology, which has yet to be proven. Nobody's making any money yet, but these companies, in my humble opinion, probably will continue to buy these chips. So at least over the next three months, I don't think that's going to be a major issue. So this is why, like, you know, it's a bit different than the IT bubble of 2000. I mean, in the sense that, you know, this time people, some these companies are actually buying real things that contribute directly to GDP growth. Whether these things are going to, you know, pay off in the long term, that's anybody's guess. But for the time being, these companies are sending a lot of cash. They've decided they cannot afford to be left behind and they're going to basically all going for it. So I think from that point of view, the economy is slowing, but I don't think it's falling off the cliff. Now, it will fall off the cliff if the stock market has an even bigger correction than we've seen so far. Okay. That is, let's say, for example, S&P will have to fall below, I would argue, the pre-April level. Because if you remember, we had a correction in April. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, and the market started to rally back in the later, in the second half of April into May and, uh, and so on and so forth. If we were to fall below the pre-April level down to the low of April, then, you know, then that could be seen as a big enough shock to send the economy into a recession, right? I mean, because yeah. if you have a big, correction of the stock market, then, you know, it changes everything. I mean, it changes people's attitude, people's risk appetite, people's yep. desire and interest in, in terms of investing. Because, you know, I don't, I think, I, I, I don't, I think George Soros is a very, very bad person. I think politically speaking, especially, but he did coin a very, very important word. Okay. Called reflexivity. Yes. Which yep. I think goes a long way in terms of understanding for the layman at least about the interdependency mm-hmm. between reality and the market. Okay? Mm-hmm. And the point here is this, you know, sometimes the market is supposed to be a reflection of the economy, right? That's, mm-hmm. that's what it should be. But very often, okay, when the market is in the driver's seat, the economy follows the stock market. Okay. So when the stock market was going up and everybody says, well, AI is going to change the world. And then NVIDIA stock was going up, everything else going up with the stock because people figured, well, this is going to lift productivity across the board for all companies, all Americans are partaking in this new prosperity and so on and so forth. When the stock go up, people feel wealthier. That's the positive wealth effect and people go and spend more money. No doubt about that. And companies are much more willing to part with money to make sure that they're, you know, they, uh, they don't get left behind. But when the stock market starts to fall, People are going to have less money. People think, oh, wow, you know, maybe others are dumping this. Maybe this AI thing is a, it's a hot air and so on and so forth. And people start to pull back. And then we go into recession. So I think from that point of view, again, if the stock market were to go below the pre-April level, I would argue that perhaps that's what happens. But for the time being, at least, I don't quite see this happening. At least, you know, again, there's a lot of things going on because I think what happened the last 10, last week or so is largely about position liquidation, people being stopped out of their positions. That's all that's happened. Nothing has actually gone beyond that. That's also the reason why gold couldn't rally. I mean, a lot of your guys basically interest in gold. Gold couldn't rally because people are too long gold. So like if you're long gold and long stocks and the stocks get hit and then uh, you've got, a, you, you're, you're, you, you've got margin calls and into, you know, reduce your position, you be selling gold. So yep. all in all, what's going on right now, all that's happened over the last, again, four or five trading days is about position liquidation. I don't, if this position liquidation were to go even further and then, you know, and then you see, um, you know, let's just say we enter into bear market, let's say s and down 20%, okay, then we have a problem. But right now, I would argue, I, I don't see that happening, okay? So again, I mean, I, I just want to say this, I, I, I was, I was long VIX, I was short Euro yen. I made a lot of money. I mean, as of yesterday, I closed my entire portfolio. Like I tell, I sent an email to my institutional clients this yesterday. I said, well, I'm up 9%. I beat 
three month treasury bills by 500 basis point. I've already met my entire annual target, you know, you know, just eight months into the year, I'm done for the time being. And that's the way I'm looking at it. I think long-term, I trade short-term, but today, if I have to do anything, if you put a gun next to my head, I'll probably be buying rather than selling. Got it. Let's end on that. I would, um, I'm just under, as well as you are, just under a, a schedule here, but I would love to have you back on and we could probably go for an hour here. I would just love to have you on. I'd like to get your thoughts on the yen carry trade. That's ending. Uh, that was another question I had, but um, let's do this as, yeah, let's uh, end here. I want to thank you so much for your time. Give people a shout out. Where can they, I'm a big fan of yours. Where can people, uh, if they're a fan of their work or they want to know more, more about you, how can they reach out to you? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I retire from Wall Street at 50 in order to make my expertise accessible to the average guy, you know, in order to uh, spread the, uh, the wealth if you like. So you could find me on YouTube for free, David Wu Unbound. Okay. Excellent. All right. I will link to everything in the show notes uh, below this interview in both the podcast as well as the YouTube channel, as well as my site. David, I just want to thank you so much. You're very knowledgeable. You're one of the best named brands out there, as well as uh, very, very gracious. I, I just want to thank you for your time again. Thank you for having me. You bet. Take care.